can begin. And we're looking at how muscle contractions are turned on and turned off. Uh, the process referred to as excitation and contraction coupling. This is where the action potential events on the sarcolemma, and the sarcolemma is just the muscle term for the membrane. This region is where the contraction begins. It's going to depend on the neural input, so the stimulus coming from the motor neuron, as well as calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So after that neuron stimulates the motor end plate, which is the very highly folded uh, membrane of the muscle, there we have binding of the neurotransmitter, right? The synaptic events that we discussed there, where we have the nicotinic receptors present resulting in an end plate potential. This is the very specific type of action potential that is seen on muscle. From there, that energy, that current runs through the muscle, especially through the T-tubules, and then it gets to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and allows for the release of calcium. So those two events are in sync, and the release of calcium is what will trigger the events that we're going to discuss here. So the neuromuscular junction, we want to remind ourselves that we have a single motor neuron and that can innervate many muscle cells or muscle fibers. Each muscle fiber, however, can only receive input from one motor neuron. Um, we have a regular traditional synapse in that we have the neuron synapsing onto the motor end plate. And so the same types of events that we talked about where the vesicles are present, the receptors on the other end, acetylcholine crosses the junction, binds to the uh, cholinergic receptors. In this instance, they're gonna be nicotinic cholinergic receptors. From there, the motor end plate, which is again, that highly folded region that has lots of acetylcholine receptors will bind and then we have the end plate potential and that is how the muscle will create the contraction. Now, how does calcium come into play? So calcium, once it's released, is going to bind to troponin. So if there's no calcium present, if none of that has been released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then there's no engaging with that on troponin and the binding sites on myosin, excuse me, on actin for myosin never become exposed. And if those don't become exposed, essentially we have no muscle contraction. So the, the short story is that if there's no calcium, there's no contraction, there's no cross-bridge cycling being formed, there's no engagement or interaction between actin and myosin, and the muscle remains relaxed. On the other end, if calcium is present, if it has been released from the SR, it's going to bind to troponin, it's going to cause troponin to drag tropomyosin off of those binding sites, exposing those binding sites on actin so that myosin can bind. And now we can have prosperous cycling. And then we can see the shortening of the sarcomere, which is the muscle contraction. So no calcium, no contraction, calcium contraction. Okay. And also the degree. We'll talk about this when we get to the uh, muscle twitch and so forth, but the amount of calcium is one of the ways that we can increase the strength of the contraction. So if we have lots of calcium, we have stronger contractions. And if we have a little bit of calcium, we have slightly weaker contractions. Let's think about the steps here, and then we're actually gonna look at an illustration of them. So we begin with the action potential. This has to move down the T-tubules. We'll look at how that happens. The T-tubules are gonna be associated with DHP receptors. And these DHP receptors or dihydropyridine receptors are also coupled to ryanodine receptors. And both of these structures allow for the action potential arriving by the T-tubules to be resulting in calcium release from the SR. And again, we'll illustrate how that happens. But these two receptors are crucial in that action potential resulting in calcium release. Calcium will then enter the cytosol. It will bind to troponin. 
And just as we described, it will result in the cross blood cycling or contraction. Okay, so let's begin in a sort of step-by-step -step illustration of that process. So here is our motor neuron. Here is our Okay, I apologize. I think my internet may be a little unstable, but just give me a message in the chat if I lose connection or if you are unable to hear me for any reason. Um, okay, so the motor neuron, the axon terminal, here are our synaptic vesicles. Here is the motor end plate on the skeletal muscle. So this is essentially the neuromuscular junction. Uh, here we have the action potential on the motor neuron resulting in neurotransmitter release, and that neurotransmitter being acetylcholine can bind to its specific receptors. From there, we trigger the action potential. And if just to kind of recall the details here, if we recall a nicotinic receptor, it's a fast receptor, so it's also acting as a channel. So when the neurotransmitter binds, we have the flux of ions. In this case, we have more sodium moving in than potassium moving out. So that causes depolarization and that results in the uh, end plate potential. And then that can move along the muscle membranes of the sarcolemma, eventually down the T-tubules. So these orange structure, or sorry, green structures here are the T-tubules, the invaginations or the tunnels that are running through the muscle fibers. And so from there, this is what allows the action potential to go through the muscle very quickly, these T-tubules. So it moves through these invaginations and now it can help to result in calcium release because the T-tubule is sort of attached to the SR via the two receptors that we're gonna talk about. From there, calcium is released from the SR and it doesn't go outside the cell. It is just released from the SR into the cytoplasm, right? Or into the sarcoplasm on, on, in the case of muscle. From there, it can bind to troponin, which are the pink regulatory proteins on actin. So the entire strand, which is blue, is the entire actin filament. The pink proteins, right? The little balls, those are the troponin uh, proteins. That's where calcium would bind. And then the thread-like purple proteins are tropomyosin. But because troponin has three spots, if you look really closely, it has three little bubbles. One is for calcium. One is for it to be attached to actin at the base. And the third one in the middle is for it to bind to that tropomyosin, that regulatory protein. So when the calcium binds to troponin, it can drag those tropomyosin proteins to expose those binding sites. From there, myosin can now engage to those exposed binding sites, and then it can drag actin towards the center of the sarcomere, which is that cross bridge cycle process. Now, this is gonna cause the muscle to contract, but in order for the muscle to relax or to go back to its relaxed state, we have to rid the sarcoplasm of the excess calcium. So that calcium has to go back into the SR. And so we have pumps on the SR that can help put that calcium back. And that is what will remove the calcium from troponin. And now we can cover up those binding sites and we will turn the contractions off or return the muscle to its relaxed state. All right, so here we can see those binding sites are now covered up. Calcium can no longer bind, and so we can no longer have myosin bind and result in muscle contraction. So really important just to compare the two states of muscle and look at what the actin filament looks like in both of those states. So in the relaxed state, the myosin binding sites on actin are covered up. Troponin has no calcium bound to it, and so the muscle is relaxed. In the contracted state, now we have lots of calcium in the sarcoplasm. Now it can bind to troponin, and now we can drag tropomyosin away from those binding sites. They can be exposed and myosin can bind. 
Okay. And then this video is in Brightspace. I encourage you all to review it or just look at it. It's a good way to illustrate some of these concepts in a 3D way. Um, let's talk about how the gating mechanism is involved. So the two receptors we mentioned earlier, the dihydropyridine receptor and the ryanodine receptor. So this is the gating mechanism on the sarcoplasmic reticulum that is coupled to the T-tubules, right? These two things are attached. Here's a T-tubule, which is the invagination or tunnel. Here is the SR storing all the calcium. And then here's the ryanodine receptor, which is on the side facing the SR. And then the DHP receptor on the side facing the T-tubule. So calcium is going to bind to these uh, or be released from the SR, and it's actually going to induce more calcium channels to be opened up. This is what we refer to as calcium-induced opening and calcium-induced closing. So calcium does both things. When it is released from the SR, so when the electrical impulse arrives onto the DHP receptor, from being, um, you know, moving through the T-tubule, that is going to result in the ryanodine receptor opening up. So the ryanodine receptor being coupled to that DHP receptor can pick up the voltage change and can open up this gateway that allows calcium to move from the SR out into the sarcoplasm, as we can see here. That opening up and that release of the initial amount of calcium further triggers more channels to open up and more calcium to be released and then more muscle contraction. Okay, now just as we mentioned before, in order to terminate the contraction, calcium must leave troponin. In other words, it must leave the sarcoplasm altogether. So there are calcium ATPase pumps that are present on the SR membrane that will help to pump that calcium back into the SR and stop it from binding to troponin and cease that muscle contraction.